Let's look at the following. Carbocation faints. In other words, what are the things that happen to carbocations? And let's just take one step back and let's imagine that I just put an energy axis like this. And I realize that all of our energies are always comparative. We're comparing one thing to another. But if you generally think of high energy stuff being up here and low energy stuff being down here, can you put a carbocation on this diagram? Just whatever carbocation you want. Uh, you don't even have to specify its exact structure. Just put it somewhere on this diagram and also specify whether it's a local energy minimum or a local energy maximum. In other words, is it one of these or is it one of those? A carbocation is one of these. It's a local energy minimum, but it's a high local energy minimum. So, you know, we might put it up here somewhere. So right there, there's my carbocation. The point is twofold. First of all, I want you to know that a carbocation is a local energy minimum, not a local energy maximum. It's not a transition state. It's an intermediate. Second of all, we might expect carbocations to not hang around very long. They're going to be quite reactive because, well, you're way up here, and if you can just overcome some small barrier, maybe, you can go on to product. Okay? So I want to start thinking about our list of carbocation fates. We will have a grand total of three things on this list by the end of the semester. And that will pretty much be it as far as carbocation fates are concerned. So it's not like we have to know 25 different carbocation fates. So I want you to think about what you know so far about organic chemistry and write down carbocation fate number one. So you've seen a reaction that proceeds through a carbocation. Please think about what that reaction is and what happens to the carbocation. What is the fate of that carbocation in that reaction? Well, the reaction that you know is SN2. Uh, no, it's not SN2, it's SN1. And so in the SN1 reaction, uh, what happens to the carbocation? A nucleophile adds to the carbocation. as in SN1. So be sure you know that. What I want to do now is I want to work through a problem where something else can happen to the carbocation intermediate. All right? So let's just come over here to this board and let's start with the following compound. So let's do a little nomenclature here. What would you call this compound in terms of, not really its systematic name, but more of its common name? So think about how many carbons there are and, uh, and so on. What would you call this? This has four carbons. So it's a butane type of derivative, at least in a common naming scheme. So we'll call it butyl, but you may remember there are various isomers of butyl X. So focus on the carbon to which the chlorine is attached. What kind of carbon is that? Is that a methyl carbon, a primary carbon, a secondary carbon, a tertiary carbon, or a quaternary carbon? And maybe the answer will clue you in on what the common name of this would be. This carbon has three other carbons attached, so this is a tertiary carbon. And so we might call this tertiary, or just tert for short, tert 
butyl chloride. What was done with this starting material was to dissolve it in a mixture of water. And that was 80% of the, the solvent. And then the other 20% was ethanol. And you may remember from some of the previous assigned problems, sometimes a co-solvent like ethanol, an alcohol co-solvent, is used when you want to use water as your main solvent. The problem is that a molecule like tertiary butyl chloride is not particularly soluble in water. So you need a co-solvent that is soluble, uh, well, that is mixable with water itself and that also helps to dissolve the compound. All right? So what I want you to predict, I want you to predict what would the substitution product B, and do you think the substitution product would be formed in an SN1 manner or in an SN2 manner? And let me just tell you that we're going to be concerned with the substitution product wherein water is acting as the nucleophile rather than ethanol. There's more water around, so let's, let's stick with the water. It's 80% of the solvent versus 20% ethanol. All right, so what I want you to write is I want you to write the substitution product and I want you to tell me, you don't have to write the mechanism, although you could, but I want you to tell me what kind of mechanism you expect to be operative here as far as substitution chemistry is concerned. In the substitution product, you're going to replace the leaving group, Cl, with the nucleophile, H2O, and then at the end of that, you're going to lose a proton. So the final product is going to be an alcohol. The product of substitution would be this one. There it is. And if you balance the equation, what are we missing? Well, we're missing the chloride. And then we're missing the extra proton from H2O. So if we were going to balance this, it would be a proton and a chloride. And if we wanted to be more realistic, the proton would be glommed on to water. So you could write that as H3O plus being one of the products and Cl minus being the other. So you definitely want to be sure you could write the mechanism out. And what would the mechanism be? Do you think it would be an SN2 mechanism? Tertiary alkyl chloride, no SN2. This must be via an SN1 type of mechanism that we get to the substitution product. Okay? So be sure you can, I won't write that out, but be sure you can do that. There's a key intermediate, of course, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But first, let me tell you that, yes, it's true, some of this was isolated from the reaction mixture, but there was also a second product, and the second product didn't have an OH group in it. It actually had a carbon-carbon double bond. So the other product is this. It's an alkene. So how does that product compare to the starting material? So if you were going to compare the molecular formula of the starting material to the molecular formula of this alkene, what has been gained what, or what has been lost? From here to here, we are somehow losing a proton again and chloride. So one way to think about this is we've eliminated the elements of HCl. So you see this carbon right here, if, if we think that this carbon becomes this one, starts out with three hydrogens, it ends up with two hydrogens, so we've lost an H from there. And then at this carbon, we've lost the chloride. And then these two methyl groups are still there, right? 
So sometimes this is called an elimination reaction. Why? Well, because you are eliminating two pieces and you're putting a double bond in. All right, so when you hear the word elimination, think to yourself, removal of something from one carbon, removal of something from the adjacent carbon, and the product of an elimination reaction will contain an alkene, a carbon-carbon double bond, okay? So what I want you to do now, now we're gonna have to get into the mechanism a little bit because we're supposed to be talking about carbocation fates. I want you to draw the carbocation that forms upon departure of the leaving group from tertiary butyl chloride. And while you do that, I'm just going to pause the video myself here so that I can erase the other board. All right, I'm back. The task was to take tertiary butyl chloride, let the leaving group go, and then draw the carbocation that results from that. So here's the departure of chloride. I'll go this way. So at this point, I'm going to end up with a carbocation. I'll draw it edge on like this. There's a plus charge here. The chloride has left. And now there's a 2p orbital, an empty 2p orbital associated with this carbocation. Can you draw it in? Well, that 2p orbital will be perpendicular to the trigonal plane. The trigonal plane of this sp2 hybridized carbocation is perpendicular to the board. So here is the empty 2p orbital associated with that carbocation. And then, for practice's sake, I recommend that you show how you get from this carbocation plus water to that final alcohol, tertiary butyl alcohol product. Remember, water adds as the nucleophile first, and then there's a deprotonation step at the end to get to the, SN, the final SN1 product. So be sure you can do that. So certainly, remember we talked about carbocation fates. It wasn't that long ago, maybe a few minutes ago. <laughs> But remember what fate number one is? Fate number one is you can add a nucleophile, and that would give the substitution product. We won't do that here, but you should definitely be able to do that. And then we have a second carbocation fate. We'll fill in a description of it in just a second. But I just want to introduce you to a little bit of terminology here. This carbon, the carbon to which the leaving group was attached, uh, let's call that the alpha carbon. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, of course, and uh, we'll give that priority to this carbon. And then attached to alpha is, guess what, beta. So here's the beta carbon. And we said elimination involves loss of a leaving group from the alpha carbon and loss of a proton from the beta carbon to put a double bond in between alpha and beta, okay? So we've gone part way. We've gotten to this carbocation. The second carbocation fate then might be described in the following way, lose H plus from next door. So if you're alpha, the next door position is beta. So can you do this? Can you show the loss of H plus from the beta carbon? And we're going to make a double bond. All right, so we're going to lose H plus from next door to form an alkene between alpha and beta. So can you do that? And my first hint is it's hard to show that when you just have this written out as CH3. The first thing you might want to do is to just draw out the CH bonds at the beta carbon. So try doing that. And then remember, a proton is not just going to fall off. You need a proton remover. What do you call a proton remover? What's a slightly more 
chemist, chemi chemically sophisticated way of referring to a proton remover, you need a base. So think about what is the strongest base I have in this vat. Okay? Don't just invoke some crazy base that's not even there. Figure out what is the strongest, most available base that I have. Okay, so let's start over here. I'm just going to uh, hang on. Here we go. Let's beautify this a little bit. So let me put in my three hydrogens. Here's one of them, and here's another, and here's another. What did you conclude was the best base you had around? Chloride? That wouldn't be the best choice because if you use chloride as a base, you're going to generate HCl. HCl in aqueous solution doesn't make sense, right? Because you know HCl is fully dissociated. So if you chose chloride, think again. The best base I have around here is just H2O. There's more H2O than ethanol, so that's why I pick it versus ethanol. But so here is my best base. Let's put the lone pairs on here. So can you push the arrows? We need to use our best base to remove a proton from beta, and we need to make a double bond. And here's a slightly more sophisticated stereoelectronic question. Remember, stereoelectronics has to do with the positioning of electrons in three-dimensional space, orbital alignment, that sort of stuff. I've drawn the hydrogens at the beta position to suggest that there's one of the three hydrogens as drawn that is best situated for this process of forming a double bond between alpha and beta. So if you're going to deprotonate one of those three hydrogens, see if you can pick the stereoelectronically preferred one. Well, it's this one because this sigma bond is aligned with the 2p orbital. So let's see how this goes. Here comes one arrow. And then I'm going to use these two electrons to make a double bond. Think of this movie, right? So I've just shown you the beginning of the movie. As this movie proceeds, what happens to the hybridization of the beta carbon? It starts out as what and it ends up as what? The beta carbon starts out as sp3, and by the end of this movie, it's sp2. There's a carbon-carbon double bond between alpha and beta. So here is alpha. Here is beta. Notice alpha started out sp2, and it ends up sp2. And then these hydrogens, during the course of this deprotonation, they move somewhat so that we end up with this nice flat alkene. The plane of the alkene here is drawn perpendicular to the board. And this is the second carbocation fate, and it is called elimination. Okay, so look what happens. The leaving group leaves, we make a carbocation. Now this carbocation has two possible pathways that it can react by. It can go through substitution, addition of a nucleophile, that's carbocation fate number one. That ultimately leads to the SN1 product. But there's also a second pathway, which may be quite competitive with the first, in which you lose a proton, this, from next door, from the beta position. Notice this is lost as a proton because it leaves its pair of electrons behind. You lose a proton from next door, you make a double bond, and that carbocation fate is known as elimination. So you now know two of what will eventually be three carbocation fates. Fate number one, add a nucleophile to the carbocation. That's the one you're already familiar with. And here's this new one. The carbocation can undergo elimination. That means loss of a proton from the carbon next door to form a double bond. 